Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Meneses, and thank you for that very uh, generous introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the analysis of cyber threats affecting the survivability of online digital projects. And I've been known for uh, doing this research for some time and uh, painting a grim picture on uh, the future of our projects. And unfortunately, this talk is not going to be different, which explains the subtitle of This is Not Fine. And uh, I'm doing this work with uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Martin. Uh, John is not here because he will be attending his graduation ceremony, but I have a video to play from the part of his work. So I think it's time to get started. So how did we get here? So uh, our previous work has been, focusing, has been focused on the lifespan of DH projects listed in the ad hoc book of abstracts. So what we have been doing is, we have been uh, mining the ad hoc book of abstract that is published after each DH conference and finding all the URLs for all the projects listed in this publication. And, we're, and we, what we have been doing systematically is founding the average lifespan of a project. And what we have found from our previous work is that projects uh, remain online or they are online for about six years. After that, they start degrading, uh, showing some imp uh, implicit errors, mostly in their uh, content, and they slowly degrade and they stop responding after some time. So what we have been focusing in the past is mostly focusing on how software degrades over time. But what we have been focusing on the work that we're going to be presenting today is how does the uh, underlying mechanism, the operating systems, how does that play uh, in, what part does it play in uh, the lifespan of these projects going offline after some time. So our premise is that uh, insecurity can contribute to a project demise as well. So what did we do? So we used a combination of uh, Python, uh, Shodan, which is uh, basically a search engine for uh, open ports and open vulnerabilities for uh, machines that are connected to the internet. And we also used threat intelligence lists. So what we did was we first gathered uh, all the host names that were listed in the ad hoc book of abstracts, but then we also used the, all the articles that are published in DH quarterly. And we did that just to make sure that our uh, uh, first data set wasn't biased, so we used a second data set to sort of validate what we were finding. So using all these URLs, we created a set of uh, unique uh, IP addresses, then we passed this these uh, IP addresses to uh, Shodan's API, collected the results after that, and then we created visualizations of the ports and observed the uh, CVEs that these uh, machines were uh, displaying. And with that, I'm gonna play a video. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we're gonna look through two sets of data, um, that from the Azure Book of Abstracts and the issues of digital humanities quarterly that we talked about. Uh, we'll start with ADHO. So uh, after applying our methodology and getting results from Shodan, we found that these uh, 50 ports were the top most commonly open ports among the hosts that we observed. And um, as we'll see here on the left-hand side, um, there are some things that we expect to be public, obviously. Uh, AD and 443 are typically for HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Uh, we have 22 for SSH, we have some mail server ports. Uh, shout out to IRC in the bottom right corner. Um, great to see you, although you're probably up past your bedtime. On the right hand side, uh, we've got uh, things that are expected to be private, um, some alternate HTTPS ports, things like that. Nothing that screams critical vulnerability, but things that are indicative rather of a lack of firewall. Um, below that we have uh, things that are for remote control, your C-pan, ad, C -panel, uh, admin panels, um, and the like, things that really ought to be behind some sort of authenticated proxy, at least. Um, and then on the bottom right, things that are always unsafe when they're public. Um, we have plain old FTP, we have um, DNS with redirection enabled, so it can be used in a DDoS attack. We've got MySQL, Postgres, Redis, Mongo, any number of things that really shouldn't be directly accessible on the internet. Um, to give you a sense of just the whole scope of that, we've got all the open ports on this slide. Um, if you are looking through the repository, you can, you can browse these visualizations in more detail. Uh, if you click on the various boxes, you'll see more information. Um, what I will point out is that the addition of the likely malware box 
in the bottom right corner. Um, we did find evidence of some reverse shells and crypto miners and that sort of thing um, among the data set. So clearly there's a patching and firewalling um, conversation we need to have, but we will at the moment. Moving on then, um, these are CVEs, the top 50 observed um, among about 17,000 vulnerabilities in the whole set. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, CVE, it's a common um, framework. Uh, you can visit cve.org. It's a common framework for keeping track of vulnerabilities found in software, proofs of concept of how to exploit them, tips on remediating them, and so on. Uh, they're assigned these scores, um, one through 10, well, zero through 10. And uh, for our purposes here, anything that's 4.0 or lower is generally considered low. Uh, four to seven is medium. Uh, yes, four is a weird place for medium. Uh, seven to nine is typically considered high, and nine to 10 are critical. Um, what's worth noting is that once we start getting to seven, we're starting to get to things that allow remote control, that allow you know, from arbitrary code execution, things like that. Um, so when we look at this top 50, yes, there's a very large box called five, but there's also a very large box called 7.5, and there's some sixes here. Um, Another thing to point out about CVEs is that they come in the format CVE, the year, and an ID number. And if you look through these slides, you'll quickly notice that there's a lot of 2019, 2016, 2015. Um, there's a 1999 in our data set. Um, clearly, patching is something we need to talk about. And this, again, is just the whole spread, which you're welcome to browse at your leisure. Um, I will note that this includes a 10.0 box. And that 10.0 box has hundreds of hosts in it. And some of these CVEs are more than 10 years old. So again, um, it's not really enough just to put our stuff online. We have to look after it. And part of just basic looking after stuff is patching. I know we hear this a lot. Um, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So um, rather than report, repeat the whole sad story for DH Quarterly, what I will tell you, and you can browse through this in our repository, is that um, the data is roughly the same. The open ports look about the same. Uh, the CVEs, roughly the same again, distribution. Um, and you know again, hundreds of hosts in that 10.0 box. Now, lest anybody feel that I'm singling out anybody with this, uh, here is a map of the world with dots denoting all of the places that have CVEs of 4.0 or greater. And if you look um, at our map of where all the links go in the repository, where all the hosts are, you'll find that this basically overlaps with that map one-to-one. -one. And what I want to stress here is I don't believe that this is a problem of um, economics, although obviously that's involved. Um, but I think, you know, we're, in this map here, we have the top 15 academic domains uh, from the ad host set that has CVEs of a score greater than eight. Um, and, you know, there's very wealthy institutions here like Stanford um, and more modestly funded uh, places like UMass, where I used to teach. Um, so again, this is just the tip of the iceberg kind of thing, but this is just to drive home, you know, this really is everyone's problem. Uh, it's something that we collectively need to work on. And, you know, finally, um, just a slide of stuff we really shouldn't have found. Um, on the left-hand side here, these are things that we found in the set of hosts that um, did not require any authentication. Samba file shares, um, which, yes, some of them are vulnerable, if you're familiar with Eternal Blue, which led us to the WannaCry malware. Uh, it was kind of a big deal. Uh, Plex admin servers, um, again, like no authentication. Um, Jenkins admin panels, VNC and remote desktop, which directly allow for remote control of your machine, things like Memcache, B, MongoDB, Redis, MySQL, Postgres, a number of them without any authentication required. Um, and, you know, just things that are undead. Uh, we found Telnet on about a dozen different ports um, and plain old FTP. Both are things that are serviceable, but again, they send your password in plain text, uh, which can lead to other problems. Um, what I would stress to take the takeaway from this slide is that uh, your vulnerabilities are your neighbor's vulnerability. If you're sharing a hosting, if you're sharing a server, allowing these things to go unpatched um, creates an attractive nuisance for hackers to come and visit your server. Um, so let's talk about patching and firewalling, Louise. So that is my cue for my last two slides. So uh, yes, a lot of these problems uh, can be eliminated by patching and uh, firewalling. And uh, 
Yes, considering the age of these uh, CVEs, some of them are pretty old. Some of them are from the year 2000. So uh, we found that patching and applying updates is the uh, great equalizer. And uh, yes, uh, just having someone to look after your uh, things does not guarantee that you're immune to hacks. And uh, that is all I have. We have put together a wiki that provides some uh, further steps on how to secure your things online. So feel free to browse that material on your own time. Thank you very much.